Well, I'm going to add my welcome to Catherine's. Uh, I'm Richard, married to Catherine. Also, Vicar here, and uh, I'm facing this way just so I can kind of eye up those on Zoom and hopefully see you as well. Uh, so, um, we are going through the book of uh, Ephesians at the moment. I'm just finding my notes. Hang on. Bear with me. And uh, we are arriving at uh, Ephesians chapter 4 today. Uh, so if you have a Bible, if you've picked one up as you come in, there is a, a box at the back. Uh, so if you didn't manage to get one, you do want one. Uh, as long as you're not kind of bumping into each other, I'm sure you can go and grab one uh, or turn it on on your phone if you, if you want to. Um, so we are in uh, the letter to the Ephesians. And that's towards the end of the New Testament. And we're at chapter four today. Now, this, we've called this series, as we go through Ephesians, we've called it uh, being a new people. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot that's new at the moment, isn't there? There's new restrictions that are coming in uh, every, every week, it seems. New COVID measures, uh, a new tier system, a new way of kind of measuring things and deciding who goes into what uh, category. We've got used to new things being new for a few weeks before they change. You know, something is only new uh, for a relatively short amount of time before the next new thing comes along. Now, some um, think we'll be living differently like this for six months. Some think it will be even longer. Uh, and uh, many had hoped back in March that we might even be back to normal again now um, and the optimists were hoping that you know we'd have maybe had a vaccine um, but uh, the the new normal is changing all the time and no one really knows how long we'll be living uh, with this instability and change but when God makes something new when God makes a new people it's a timeless change. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. The new is here to stay. When God makes something new, it doesn't change. It's a permanent change for all eternity so if you have if you've put your trust in jesus and decided to follow him that means that that is a new change you are a new creation forever it's not going to change even though everything around us may be changing and unstable and unpredictable it, it just seemed a good idea in this season, particularly for us as a church, to look at the unchanging God and to remind ourselves that we are his new unchanging creation. A new people with an identity that won't change. Now, the letter to the Ephesians is a great place to go to help us understand what that looks like uh, and how it looks in light of Jesus. Because actually a lot of that change is worked out over time. You get a new identity, but actually living into the reality of that new identity, becoming that new people, will take time. And it's up to us as to whether we want to step into it. Now we began in chapter one by looking at our identity and how that is not really about who we are who we are but whose we are we are in christ and a citizen of heaven the old creation roots us primarily in our physical and emotional situations so where we live or our ethnicity or our age or our abilities whether we're married or we're single our sexuality or our gender identity the career we have or responsibilities and abilities that we might have 
that is what the old creation says your identity is rooted in. But the new creation, when we are in Christ, it trumps all of those things and says that we are primarily his, we're not our own anymore. That means we let go of all those things that we identify within the world and we take on his identity. And it's a, it's a gift of grace, not something that you can earn or achieve or prove or even create yourself or maintain. It's something that's given. And that's hugely freeing. And that's why if you're sitting here today and maybe you, uh, you don't really know Jesus for yourself and you don't, wouldn't say that your identity is in Christ yet, that's why it's great news, because you don't have to maintain or create an identity to prove yourself to the world. Jesus gives you one. And he gives you an identity that is his. And it's incredibly freeing. And it's good news for our world that, that there's an identity they can have as a new creation. So over the weeks, as we read through Ephesians, uh, we'll begin to see a theme of unity that Dan touched on last time, two weeks ago, at our last celebration. Uh, and uh, he looked at it in the context of the spiritual realm and, um, and how that affects uh, our unity and how our unity has an impact on the spiritual realm and, and how that's critical to changing the uh, community here in Twerton. But I want to continue to explore that theme of unity uh, today as we move into chapter four, specifically our oneness, our oneness as a church, as a mark of our identity as a new people. So we're going to just read through, as all the preamble really, read through uh, the, first, uh, the first verses of chapter four. Uh, this will be on the screen. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and be gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given in, as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descends is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. There is heaps of stuff in there, far too much to really unpack in the time we have together this morning. So I, I want to encourage you to, to take this passage away with you, maybe do some reading around it, and uh, don't, don't just uh, settle for what I'm sharing this morning. But the, as I said, there's a theme of unity that is beginning to be unpacked as Paul begins to look at uh, what unity looks like in the church. And then we'll, we'll see further down uh, through, the, through the letter uh, different as aspects of what unity looks like. Now, I wonder, do you know why uh, so many football teams are called X-United, yeah. Man United? 
Newcastle United, as we see here on the screen. Anyone know why? Some of you might actually know why, and you're just being modest. But uh, for Newcastle United, the reason uh, why they ended up with that name is because there were two clubs, Newcastle West End and Newcastle East End, that came together and they became one united team. They realised that they were better together than they were apart. Now, if we look at what, what's the opposite of unity, it's separation, isn't it? Before we were made, we were separated. Before we were made new, sorry, we were separated from God and each other. Now we are a new people, we are united with Jesus and united with each other. So we can call ourselves St. Michael's United. Not that I think we do very well in, in any football leagues, but that is, that is God's heart for us, that we would be a united local church. Paul knows that the, the enemy's best strategy is to divide and conquer. Your identity might be new, but you might still act like the old identity. The enemy wants you to operate as an old creation, not the new people you truly are in Christ Jesus. So he tries to separate and isolate us. Now, he'll do that in different ways. It might be that you are, you've become offended by someone, maybe by me. Maybe you've taken offence by something that was said or an action or something that wasn't said and wasn't acted. You've taken offence and decided to isolate yourself. Or maybe it's that you are just got, you've got things going on in life that just means that you, you just, you've become too overwhelmed by the circumstances you're in. And who knows, it's so easy when you feel overwhelmed to isolate and separate. You know, the enemy tries to separate Christians from one another, and he'll use whatever way he can to do it. Because he knows that when we are united, when we are one as a body, as a family, working together, that we, we will have, make a big impact in our community. Catherine is going to look at, look at uh, how the enemy wants to separate and divide marriages and families in a few weeks' time. Um, and that's further on in the letter that Paul speaks about unity in the family. Uh, but today I want to focus on, on how, how we work towards unity in the church family. Because the enemy will want to separate us. And independence is the enemy of unity. Yet independence is often how many of us actually operate. And maybe even we sometimes strive for independence. Our da daily devotions this week have been uh, following the, the book of John. As a church, we put up a, uh, a little video from a different member of the church on, on our Facebook group. Um, based in a passage in John's Gospel. And this week we've been uh, in John's, uh, John 17, Jesus' prayer. And he prays for unity. He prays that the church will be one. John actually is writing to the same group of people as Paul is here in Ephesus. So we've got this week John's been saying... Jesus wants us to be united. And this week, Paul's saying that God wants us to be united. So I think he's trying to say something to us. Uh, so it's a double whammy. Um, and if unity is the goal, and if God wants his people to be united, I want us to look at just two aspects of that that can come under threat. The first is being united uh, with each other in the local church. So locally, as a church, how... How does that look and what could be some of the enemy's tactics to try and separate us? Well, Paul begins by reminding us that he is a prisoner for the Lord. He starts by saying, as a prisoner for the Lord. Uh, now, I'd, I've only 
uh, been stopped by the police two times. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it came up in my uh, CRB check before they gave me this job. So here it is. This is the revelation, the confession time. <laughs> Your vicar was stopped by the police. First time was just after I passed my driving test and I uh, forgot to turn my lights on and it was dark. And uh, got blue flashing lights behind me, pulled over. They were very understanding and compassionate and just gave me a friendly warning. Second time though, second time, a bit, bit, more, bit more interesting. A friend and I went prayer walking around an estate in Sheffield. So some of the missional communities at the moment are uh, getting into small groups of six or less and prayer walking. Just watch out, okay? <laughs> watch out. Anything can happen when you prayer walk. Well, we came across a phone box. Any of you children actually know what a phone box is? Probably not. We don't see many these days, do we? Uh, phone boxes uh, were where you made phone calls. Uh, surprise, surprise. But this phone box had been broken into. And as we were walking uh, away from the phone, phone box, um, a group of police cars pulled up. And uh, I thought, that's a bit overkill for a phone box. But, um, but we felt God wanted us to stop and pray for the police at a distance. You know, we're just trying to be responsive to, to what God is doing. And so we pray, praying for these police just discreetly at a distance and uh, praying for justice and things like that. And then noticed that police had spotted us and they came running over to us and started searching us and checking through our bags. And, uh, and uh, I was saying, they said, what are you doing? And we said, uh, we're prayer walking. <laughs> and uh, I don't think they quite knew what to do with that. That's not what they were expecting. And uh, fortunately, they were, again, understanding and let us go. But Paul here has been properly imprisoned. Uh, why? Because he loved Jesus and so loved God's church that it affected the way he lived and it actually uh, had repercussions in, uh, in the society where he was uh, planting churches and proclaiming that Jesus was Lord. And the more we fight for unity and the more we're likely to come up against forces that try to separate and isolate us. And Paul here has been isolated from the churches that he's planted from the, the, the Christians that have come to faith. Paul's just been taken out and put in a prison. And you might think, uh, well, that would put an end to it. Well, it didn't seem to put an end to what Paul's, to Paul's fruitfulness. And, and actually, he's been isolated from the other believers, but that doesn't stop him urging Christians to press in, opt in, and step into community. And we right now are in a situation where we are being isolated and separated for good reasons. Like, this is not bad reasons, like in Paul's case. These are, this is for our health, and for the health of particularly of the vulnerable people who, uh, who are more vulnerable to catching this virus. And so I'm not arguing that it is wrong that we are being separated, but it's, it's a reality, isn't it? We are being separated from meeting with each other. And, and yet that ought not to stop our decision to opt in, step in, press in to community. As a prisoner for the Lord, Paul says, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. He knows that our natural tendency is toward independence and isolation. So he, he then says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love, and make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort. Why does he say that? Well, it's because he knows that if we don't put effort in, we will naturally isolate and separate. That's our natural tendency as humans, when we, particularly when we're faced with adversity and challenge. Unity doesn't just happen. It, in fact, the complete opposite happens if we don't put effort in. We have been separated and isolated by this pandemic, and so we have to make every effort to keep united around the Holy Spirit. Now, whilst this crisis 
uh, has the potential to create opportunities for togetherness. And I'm just, I want to say thank you for choosing today, and you on Zoom as well, choosing today to come and come together, either physically or virtually. You didn't have to, no one's forced you, and yet you've chosen, you've made that choice, and you're sitting here, many of you can't feel your fingers because it's a bit cold. <laughs> and it's very important to remember now that we, because of circulation, we have to keep the doors open. So it's worth coming with gloves and come with your hats and scarf if you want, you know, just dress up as warmly as you can uh, whilst we're able to meet physically. But let's be honest about some of the potential barriers to unity right now. Let's be honest that actually it, it's a little easier, I think, to be a bit more passive about community and togetherness and our faith. So the, the first thing I, I've observed that um, is a potential barrier to unity right now is with the ability to access church gatherings virtually, uh, we can slip into, if we're not careful, the mindset of watching church as a spectator, just like we'd watch any other TV show. Now, I think it's, it's, we've, made, we've made a conscious choice as a church to use Zoom um, because it enables more interactivity. But, but that's not to say it's not still easy to, uh, to watch it with a coffee sitting on a comfy sofa and to you know, I, I've been guilty of turning my video off uh, on, on occasions and just nipping to the toilet and, you know, having a little conversation. You know, it's really easy to uh, become passive and just become a spectator of church. And Paul says, but live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Let's opt in. Live a life worthy of the calling to unity. The second thing I've observed is, um, is that actually with this situation it, um, that we're in where the government are making decisions on our behalf that infringe upon our liberties, uh, and you can disagree whether they or agree whether they are right decisions or not, there is a temptation for our speech and what we post online and the way we talk uh, about our government and about such matters to become di divisive. From, and that could be from extreme anxiety fueling the way you talk uh, to extreme protest against uh, what you feel is, is unjust. If you know your words could cause division by what you're posting or what you're saying in public, consider what effect they might have on the unity of the local church family. Paul says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now, that's not to say you can't have opinions, that's not to say you can't share things uh, in wise company, in the right context, but, but do be discerning about where you say things and how you're saying things and the implications it will have on the unity of the body. So I would suggest that Facebook is not always the best place to post something that could be divisive. The third, third area that is potential uh, barrier to unity is beware of the temptation to use COVID as an excuse <laughs> to opt out of uh, togetherness. And the places of community within the church whether that's a celebration service or a missional community, because I, I know the temptation myself. This is something I personally wrestle with. It's really easy to use COVID as an excuse to opt out, claiming it's unsafe or, or it, you know, it would put someone else at risk when I'm perfectly happy to go shopping or to a restaurant where there's even less safe measures in place. Now, I'm not saying that there will be times when you need to make a careful decision and a wise decision about what is safe. And last celebration, I had to make just that decision. I had a cold, wasn't sure if it was COVID, pretty sure it wasn't, but I had to make that decision not to come in person. 
I'm not saying that we don't, we just kind of abandon all wisdom around that. I'm just saying that be careful when you know that you're just using it as an excuse to opt out because it's uncomfortable or inconvenient to your life to opt into community. Paul says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Now, we're not going to achieve unity by opting out. The point is we need each other. We need each other. We're meant to be interdependent. I think I spoke about this last year sometime. can't remember what it, what it was about or why I was saying it, but we need to be interdependent, not dependent or independent, but interdependent. Interdependency says, I need you as much as you need me. I need you as much as you need me. It's one of the reasons why we've made a conscious shift in this church toward everyone in the church taking an active role in disciple making. Why we're encouraging everyone to join a missional community. Why we're encouraging everyone to have a go at sharing a daily devotion. Some of you may be thinking, you're just a lazy vicar who doesn't want to do all of the hard work and you're getting us to do it for you. Yes. That is partly true, but I'm not lazy. It's because I'm driven by a vision to see you all become the people that God has made you to become and for us to operate as a body. Twerton and the city needs every gift God has placed in this community to be used, not just the expertise of a staff team. It may feel a bit tiring at times, and I know it's an exhaust, particularly exhausting time to begin encouraging the whole church to step out and step into uh, their callings and take on more responsibility. I know it's tiring, it's exhausting, and it can feel inconvenient. Maybe you like the idea in principle of priesthood of all believers, but actually the reality of it um, is maybe harder than you realize. Hold on to that vision of us as a church emerging as a new people, confident in their saviour and united in our commitment to his mission here. So that's the first area of unity. I think in the local, in St. Michael's, that we would be one united church. Everyone opting in, everyone playing their part, using their gifts. The second is a united church in the city. Notice Paul addresses the letter to the saints in Ephesus. He doesn't address just one particular house church. There would have been lots of different churches meeting in Ephesus in people's homes. And Paul addresses the church in the city, all the saints in Ephesus. He uses church big C, in verse 11, Paul writes, this is chapter 4, verse 11, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists. Kirsty, I think there's a slide of this, of these verses on. Next one. Sorry, I haven't been prompting you. Thanks. Um, so Christ gave himself, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, remember, who's Paul addressing this to? He's addressing it to the church, Big C, the church in the city. So just as much as the pastors, the apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers are relevant for our small church C, local church, missional, even in your missional community, there is a part for all of those uh, leadership gifts to play a part. But Paul is actually addressing the big church in the city. And without us, St. Michael's Church in Twerton, without us playing our part, if we can have the next slide, without us playing our part, then the mission of the church in the city will be lacking. 
I've decided uh, that we are the, um, the muscles. <laughs> I thought that was the best picture. I, I choose the best picture for us. Um, so if you can see bottom left, the apostles, I don't know whether we're apostles, but you know, I had to choose something. And, but I thought, let's give ourselves some muscles. I think we are, we are a strong church. But uh, you know, we have a part to play in the mission of God in the city. That without us, uh, the church is lacking. Now we're part, Catherine and I are part of a, a group, a, a group that meets uh, every fortnight with other church leaders across the city. And it's been really encouraging getting to know these leaders. And recently we were uh, asked to share something about unity with the other leaders in the city. And Catherine and I just felt so insecure. We thought, oh, we've got nothing to offer. Don't really know what we're saying. Um, you know, we just, we feel so insignificant compared to some of these amazing church leaders of these huge churches doing these amazing things. And Catherine and I was like, well, oh, we don't, I don't really know what to say. We don't have much to offer. But we did, we gave it our best shot. But I know that our insecurity breeds dependency and independency within that group. We feel like we've got nothing really to offer. We're just dependent on them for all the wisdom and all the inspiration. But actually, it means that we distance ourselves relationally from them as well because we kind of feel a bit intimidated. And so we'd rather just get on, get on, on our own, thanks. And we'll just keep, we'll, we'll join in via Zoom and uh, just listen. <laughs> We won't say very much. Now, I actually see some of that mindset in Twerton as a whole. That mindset of dependency and independency at the same time. And you, you may think, well, how can you be dependent and independent at the same time? But I just think that we, as, as, a, as a community in Bath, that we feel overlooked the amount of times I've heard people say, oh, the council don't care about Twerton. Or they feel neglected by the authorities and the structures that are in place to support us, leading to an insecure mindset. And because of the levels of deprivation that we have here, we depend on benefits, grants and donations. As a church, we do too. We depend on benefits and grants and donations from other organization yet we are proud of being in Twerton and feel we want to be kind of separate from the city you know you come into Twerton and almost we, we live in Twerton we don't live in Bath you know it's that kind of mentality of independency from the rest of the city and many people are very proud of the heritage and history here and it is a wonderful heritage and history. But can you see how the enemy has begun to separate and divide us from the rest of the city, both as an area, but also as a church? This year, God's, this, uh, a couple of months ago, God spoke to me from uh, a psalm, Psalm 68. I've got this on the slide, Kirsty, next slide. So this psalm is... is about a procession, um, procession of all the tribes of Israel coming to the temple. Um, and it says in verse 25, uh, your procession is seen, O God, the procession of my God, my king into the sanctuary, the singers in front, the musicians last. And then in verse 27, it says, there is Benjamin, the least of them in the lead. I just felt God was speaking to me as I read this, that there is Twerton, the least of them, in the lead, stepping forward. Now, you can read the, the story of the tribe of Benjamin through the Old Testament, and they go through some pretty difficult times and actually um, commit some pretty uh, horrendous things. And yet here they are, stepping out of that place of dependency and independency and they step in into the, the procession and take the lead do we see ourselves as the least of all the neighborhoods have we ever operated as one of the least of the churches in bath 
we certainly survive financially by the generosity of the wealthier churches in Bath who subsidise actually uh, what we have to pay the diocese. So you get a full-time vicar, but you don't pay for it. That's the reality. The rest, some of the wealthier churches in Bath subsidise um, me, <laughs> essentially, and, and we get grants and donations. But what if Twerton has something of God's grace to offer the wider city? What if there's something that God has uniquely placed in us that unless we step forward and take the lead as the tribe of Benjamin did, unless we do that, the procession, the mission of God in the city is, is lacking. I'm challenged by how much of our church's vision and strategy is just focused on Twerton, and I've been having to re-reflect, you know, have we, have we kind of looked too locally? Have we looked too small? Maybe God wants us to look toward the city and see what our part is to play in the mission of God here in the city. There's some great opportunities coming up. Uh, a bunch of guys from Life Church Bath are wanting to do some amazing things here in Twerton just to bless this area, and they're wanting to partner with us. Will we join them? Will we start to partner with other churches and see how we can work together? What is our part to play? What are the gifts we uniquely have to offer the city? Let's pray, shall we? Father, we just confess our sin of dependency and independency, which has been born out of insecurity and no doubt pain and abuse over the years, but we choose to surrender that to you and we repent of our part that we've played in operating uh, with a mindset that has separated us. We pray that you would help us to be a people who step into unity, who step into oneness and become a united church here in Twerton and here in Bath. We pray for your kingdom to come as we step together as one. Your glory, we pray. Amen. Amen. I think we are moving into a time of communion now, uh, unless Catherine.